now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone, it is the one and only uh, Michael Sweet of uh, Striper. But before we get over to Michael, let us get over to the noted. Well, what are, we, what are you noted for, Alan? I'm just trying to think. Noted, uh, noted. Oh, uh, E minor. Okay. The noted E minor. E minor. <laughs> You know, those, those, those ones I'm fond of. The noted E minor, Sir Alan Niven. Bonjour, Monsieur Alan. Comment allez-vous? Ça va. Um, one, one more COVID day with the beautiful, <laughs> clean COVID blue sky outside with no jets flying through it. And uh, one more day of not, not knowing what day it is. I'm now wondering what week it is. <laughs> <laughs> all these days are the same. You and, see, that's um, why you need to move to Montreal because at least you know what season it is when it starts, you know, snowing and rainy and dark. You can go, oh, okay, well, it's no longer July. Great. All right. You know. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sitting here in the third week of November with all my doors and windows open, so <laughs> that doesn't work either. In the, but, in the um, hottest ever month or year of, of Arizona. I was reading that yesterday somewhere on, on, on the net that it's it's the hottest year ever recorded in Arizona, or Phoenix yes. at least. Yes, the, the Phoenix had uh, a record number of days where the temperature exceeded 100 degrees, and that is no fun. Especially if that was Celsius, because that, <laughs> that would really be awful. <laughs> um <laughs> When whenever I interview Michael Sweet, we o I always ask him about this album Against the Law, which is the album that he doesn't like that the band made because they changed their their concept, they changed their 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 look, and they instead of having the yellow and the black, they went purple and black. Anyway, he doesn't like it, and I was convinced we're not going to talk about it this time. And we go through the interview, and of course it came up. He brought it up though, not me. Uh, but what I want to ask you about is. This album was produced by the one and only Tom Werman, of course, Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, Motley Crue, and others. Um, did you ever, first of all, have to deal with Tom in the Motley days, or was that after you? And 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 and, and regardless of, what do you think of him as a producer? I happen to really, really like him as a producer. Um, choice of words. As a producer, uh, I have an incredible amount of respect for Tom and his feel and approach. I think he's, he, he's got that ability to get spirit and energy into a recording session. Um, I did chance across Tom a few times back in the day. He started working with the um, Dorkin after Don and I stopped living together. So I used to hear some some entertaining stories every now and then, um, but Tom could definitely make a very very good record. Absolutely. Well, you see, here's what I've always said: is you look at those uh, cheap trick records uh, that people remember. You look at shout at uh, you know the Motley stuff. You look at uh, the the Twisted Sister stuff, and every one of their most popular ones were produced by Tom and they always go, yeah, but he was the studio guy or the, the label guy that they, you know, the label producer that they threw. It's like, it doesn't matter if he's the label producer or if he's, or if he came down from the heavens, you're not going to tell me that we're not going to take it and stay hungry is a horrible album that didn't give you your career. You're not going to tell me that the Motley Crue album didn't, you're not going to tell me that dream police or whatever. So, you know, uh, well, you know, I, I, I have to say that, you know, Dream Police for me was, as a fan of Cheap Trick, is kind of where they lost me a little bit. Um, but up until that point, I thought they were fucking marvelous. They, listen, they, they've always been marvelous. And, you know, Dream, Dream Police uh, includes the best song that they've ever done called Voices. Oh, here, you know what? <laughs> this is totally off, off of talking about Michael here. Before I get to my Cheap Trick story... Uh, the band has a new album called Even the Devil Believes. Go buy it, go listen. But I got to tell you this. I first got Dream Police on an eight-track tape, right? <laughs> I know. All I right, know. stop. Yes. Stop, stop, yes, stop. Yes, Who the hell thought eight tracks were a, a good idea? 
I mean, my word, you know, they'd stop halfway through a track or something. They were the most ridiculous, cumbersome, and awful. They, they, they were way awful of transmitting but, music. But, but that's what I got to tell you because on Dream Police, there's a couple of songs that are over seven minutes. You've got Gonna Raise Hell, that's nine and a half minutes, and you've got Need Your Love, which is seven and a half minutes. And because they were on a track, I never got to hear the songs in full because they would always go, you know, three minutes and then click and then they'd go over to the next track. So I'd always hear them in these incremental little bits. And it wasn't until much, much later that I got them on CD and I went, oh, it's a nine minute song. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize. I just thought it was two different songs that had the same. Fucking a track, man. You know, someday, someday, you and I are going to have to go over formats because we had digital audio tape, which was a pain in the ass. We had mini disc, which I bought. What, what, I bought some warrant album on three inch mini disc, which, which was a fucking cluster fuck. And I, what is what is it with all these shitty these shitty versions? You know, this vinyl, CD, digital. That should have just been it. Or cassette. I mean, cassette well, had its moment, but <laughs> yeah, fucking eight I mean, track. You know, cassettes were okay, and in terms of having a mobile form of music, cassettes made sense and were competent for being mobile for the car. Um, before the Walkman came out, uh, trying to remember the name of the store, Sam Goody in Manhattan. I went in there and I found this little cassette player radio which and it was a, made by Toshiba and it was the smallest one I could ever find and it was really good to put in put in a bag when you were traveling a lot because you could you know tune into radio and I with a pair of Sennheiser headphones I'd get you know reasonable music reproduction from this tiny little unit you know so cassettes made sense albums are albums but like when we got into mini discs and stuff like this I mean I think part of it was the Japanese loved tiny things. And I think the other part of it was, oh, well, we've just seen everybody go out and buy CDs and replace their albums with CDs because we're promising they're going to be perfect and last forever. And uh, they thought, well, let's see if we can con them into buying a whole bunch of mini discs for their library too. Well, they they know, conned me on it, a couple it, of them because they were cute. They were like puppies. They were like little tiny albums. It was so cute. No, but... But uh, yeah. I never understood the digital audio tape because digital audio tape came out after CDs. And I was like, it's a digital thing. And it's, I'd, go, uh, I'd, go, I'd go, why well, would I want to step backwards into tape? Like, come on. Well, you know. Well, that's the point about digital audio tape was, um, for me, it was a studio tool because a cassette could stretch a little bit. And digital audio tapes were not prone to doing that. They did not stretch. So if I wanted to print a mix to take home, to play on my home system, before I came back in the next day to finalize the mix, then I'd put it on a DAT. And I used to have a DAT in my Range Rover. Um, and I still have my Walkman DAT from back in the 80s. But that, would, that was very much a studio reference. But it, it, it was... Um, it was eventually it was going to become you know home, but it never did. It never transferred to the home thing. And I guess I guess a lot of bands started recording their live shows with a little DAT tape. But by the way, any any of those DAT tapes at, at your place have some uh, unreleased Guns and Roses? Just just curious, just uh, curious. And what, in the garden shed, I've got a uh, box full of them of, of unreleased. God knows what's in there? Unreleased uh, Guns and. Uh, huh. Uh, no, I not not that I would be in possession of unreleased material, um, <laughs> but I I do have a box full of DATs in there, and I think you know obviously there's going to be a, a whole bunch of GNR stuff in there that was referenced. Did uh, I don't know if you can answer this? I don't know if there's any kind of legal stuff, but did did Guns N' Roses DAT their their shows? Like, did they record all their live shows? Because a lot of bands started doing that just for whatever shits and giggles or archives. Did, did you start recording all the shows? No. Um, if we were going to record a show, I wanted to get a mobile truck to do it. 
Mm. And right. uh, here's a little story I'll tell you. Um, not all the decisions that a record company makes are logical or right. And I went to the head of Geffen in, this would have been sometime in 1987. And we were, we were scheduled to go out on the cult tour. And we were going to play the Roxy before we went. And I went to Geffen and I said, listen, this may be their last club show. We're going out on the road and we're onwards and upwards from here. Give me $5,000 for budget and let me get a rental, a, a, a mobile truck up there, a recording truck, and let me record it for posterity and let's put it on the shelf. Now, that was not a, require, a contractual requirement. It was just my sense of this is a moment. The band is getting ready to go out on their first tour. There's a certain vibe in the band. They're playing well at the moment. Let's, let's, let's record it. And then we can think about releasing it later. And um, for whatever reason, uh, Eddie Rosenblatt decided that he wasn't going to untrouser $5,000 for me to record a live GNR show at the Roxy at that moment. Um, which I think if you look back historically goes, what an idiot. Can you imagine the millions of dollars of revenue that particular performance might have generated? Yeah. See, I had but, my microphone know. on mute so that people wouldn't hear me swearing, but yes. Now it may or may not have come out in 87 or 95, but if you look at, you know, 2010 or the reunion tour in 2016, you throw a professional Roxy tape out on the market. <laughs> Fuck mm. yeah, it's going to clear a million bucks easily. And it's probably going to have, you know, uh, 16 million spins on YouTube and 25 million spins on, on, on spot. Ah, oh, people. Yeah. That's why you need to hire the... fans like me to, to come in and, and tell you what is well, worth. Yeah, but here's, here's, here's the thing. We're, we're talking to Geffen, who are a multi-million dollar concern doing quite well at that time with a band called White Snake and another one that was coming through called Aerosmith and they couldn't afford $5,000. It was, it was just a little bit of penny wow. pinching pettiness. But you know. David Geffen, yeah. when COVID starts can put out pictures of him being on his private yacht and safe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you forgot about that. Did you? I haven't forgotten. Oh no, about that. I I have not forgotten. <laughs> David fuck you to the rest of the world. He goes, oh, everybody's dying, but, but I am on my private boat. It is like an island in the ocean. It's like fuck off. <laughs> a friend of mine, <laughs> who's become an even better friend since back in the day, but a friend of mine who was working at Geffen at the time, told me a story where, in the moment. He felt confident to be a little bit ballsy and chancy. And he asked David Geffen a question. And he turned around to him and he said, David, how much is enough? And Geffen turned around and said, I want it all. Maybe he was just quoting Queen. <laughs> well, you know, one Queen <laughs> quoting another one. <laughs> Ouch. Ooh, see, look at that. I made a connection, and then you made enough. That is beautiful. Uh, oh, my Lord. We, we should get over to, uh, to Michael's suite because uh, we could do this all day. Here is, from the band Striper, the one and only uh, Michael Sweet. New album, Even the Devil Believes. Uh, here's Michael. We are speaking with uh, Striper's Michael Sweet. And uh, as we say in Montreal, Le bonjour, Michael. Always a pleasure. We, we've done a bunch of these in the past, and it never gets old. I just, I just got to say, we get old, but this doesn't well, get old. You know what? Yes, we do get old, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And and corona coronavirus gets very old, but yeah. Other than that, this never gets old. Yeah. The uh, the, the the coronavirus is, is something. Now, w we can maybe talk about that at the end because every single interview now it comes up, and it's just like, all right, already. 
let's let's sure. <laughs> let, let's let's talk music. You know, in 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 May and in, in May and June, it was like, what are you going to do with the tours? But now it's like, we, nobody knows. So, uh, and, and maybe we'll even talk about your, the, the political positions. But I, I like to focus on music as much as possible. So I'll start with this. Uh, even the devil believes. The Associated Press has a, a review that I just – the headline says it all. You don't even need to read the review to know that it's good. It just says, Stripers, even the devil believes, is heavenly good. Now, come on. After 40 years, doesn't that warm the cockles of your heart? <laughs> it does, man. It, it, it absolutely does. And it's, it's, it's always even more amazing for me to, to read, uh, you know – comments like that titles like that because of who we are and what i mean by that is you know we're a band that set out to beat the odds and go against the odds at, you know 36 years ago and it, it, there's no denying that and we knew what we were getting into back then we knew it wasn't going to be easy we knew it was going to be tough and when you read things like that despite the odds uh that are stacked up against you for the most part, uh, it, it's always, you know, really gratifying. It, it puts a little bit of a smile or a smirk on my face. It's kind of cool. It's very cool. And, uh, and we'll give the guy credit. It was written by a guy named Wayne Perry for the Associated Press. So uh, kudos to Wayne for that one. That's, that's, that's the best opening line of a review I've ever read. But let's talk about the music on this album because – it is full throttle. You know, you, you get bands that as they, they get older, they decide, hey, now it's time to try to put some loops and some dance beats and try to be a little off center or, hey, it's time to try more of the acoustic stuff. And But this is not that. This is Striper being Striper. In fact, this is Striper on on, on 11, <laughs> to use the uh, the analogy. But uh, so talk to me about going into this and, and what you wanted to say and just said, you know, you know F radio. We're just going to do this. Yeah. Well, we've, you know, said F radio since 1984. Uh, radio was never our friend. And, and that's just the truth of the matter. Uh, I'll never forget our label at the time, Enigma Records. Uh, you know, they always had a radio campaign and budget for a radio campaign. And it was like pulling teeth. Now it is for many bands, but it's especially difficult for Striper. Because we always get the same feedback, you know, well, you know, the lyrics, well, you know, they sing about Jesus. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's always the same rhetoric and um, it's unfortunate. And the reason why I say it's unfortunate, because these guys that are saying that are sitting there spinning the, the new Slayer track, you know. So if it's about religion or if it's about, you know, uh, any anything other than just rock and roll or good metal music, then it's it's baloney, you know. But we 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 got that from MTV in the day. We, we when we submitted our videos, they would they would always have some reason why they wouldn't want to or didn't want to play them or view them or show them to the world. And I remember we submitted honestly, and you know we had an American flag and my my son in the video, and they came back and said it's too patriotic looking, and there's a baby in there. It's not rock and roll and. It was always something like that for us. Uh, and But it hasn't stopped us. You know, we we basically, I don't, I never write for radio. Never write. I mean, well, that's not altogether true. I still stick to the format of the song shouldn't be too long. And, you know, you should really try to deliver a hook and do this and do that. So I guess in that regard, I think of radio. But I never think about, hey, Let's write a hit for the radio and really go after that because Striper will never fit into that club ever. So, you know, I can I can see that because being in, in Canada, you know, for you to get play on much music or, or play on local radio, it really had to be at that next level. You had to be in the U2 category. You had to be in the in the, in the Madonna category. If not, they were yep. spinning Honeymoon Suite and Brian Adams, which, listen, I love, but you know the rats and 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 some of these other bands didn't get the attention and striper was on but not on like def leppard or bon jovi or these other ones were and yet here right. we are 40 years later and you've managed to succeed you've managed and correct me if i'm wrong but it seems to me as though you're increasing fans yearly because when you look on facebook and you look on twitter and you talk about the new album hey frontiers has a new this michael sweet has a new that lynch lynch sweet 
there seems to be an excitement that I didn't certainly didn't gather back in the day where it's like, oh, wow, Michael's back. Michael's back with this guy. Michael's back with this. Michael back with this. Perry Richardson. And there's always something talking about it. So, so despite all the, uh, let's call them gatekeepers that were stopping you back then, how right. did you manage to succeed? What was that secret sauce where you didn't, after five years, go, Ugh, F it, we're done. I'm just going to go work in the cranberry fields with my uncle and I'm, I'm out of here. It's it, it, so many things. I mean, okay. perseverance, perseverance and uh, hard work. I'm, I'm built different than not all people, but most people, you know, and I, I've talked about this many times, so it's getting old at this stage. But, you know, I, I am uh, OCD. You know, uh, I go around and straighten magazines on my tables, you know, uh, and, and how does that apply to my music? Well, I go around and straighten notes on, on, on the tracks. I'm a perfectionist, you know, and everything has to be in its place. And that applies to the music that I write and or produce. And also, I'm ADHD. I didn't know that uh, until, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. And um, good thing is about that, uh, you know, it's hard to, to focus uh, on some things, but it's real easy to hyper focus on other things. And thank God I hyper focus on music. You know, and, and what, what does that create those two, that combination of OCD and ADHD in me and my work ethic is a driving force that just doesn't stop. You know, you could well, uh, literally, well, I'm going to stop you a second there. I want to ask you, yeah. where, where does the work ethic come from? Is it something that is your dad said, Hey kid, this is what, you know, this is the way it is when you're 12, 13. Is it your mom? Is it a, is it a teacher? Is it, is it a pastor? Who, who instills that in you or did everybody let you run wild? And at you know twenty five, you went, "Holy, fuck, I I need to, I need to knuckle down." Like where did where did that work ethic come from? Who put it there? Who where did you get it from? My parents definitely put it okay. there to a degree. To agree, my dad's always it was always a hard worker. Worked for the railroad and worked hard for his family to pay the bills and put food on the table. And my mom was a hard worker too. You know, so I'm sure some of that rubbed off on me, but. I was definitely one of those kids that was kind of running wild, as you just put it. And, uh, you know, I discovered at some point in my life, which was probably in my late 20s, is when I really discovered like, OK, hold on a minute here. This this isn't working where I just, uh, you know, I get a paycheck and I go blow it on a Corvette or, you know, I get a royalty check and I go blow it at 20 trips to Genghis Khan. Uh, you know, and I realized like, okay, hold on, I got to start being an adult here and, and, and being responsible with what I do and what I make from what I do. And at the same time, I need to really apply myself in other areas. And that's just how I'm built. Like when I finish an album, people say, man, you need a vacation. And, and I'm laughing at that. It's like, what, what do you mean a vacation? My vacation is working. Uh, I love to work. I'll take a day or two off and then I'll dive into another project. I'm always doing a project, always. Like I just finished some bomb. I, I'm starting on a, another live thing up in New Hampshire, Michael Sweet set. And then I jump right into an album with Joel Holkstra and Nathan James. We co-write together and record together. And then right after that, I'm starting on another project. And then I've got a Sweet Lynch project. I got a solo album next year. I got a project with Alessandro at Frontiers. So my whole year is booked is filled up. My whole calendar is literally filled up to, to wow. December 2021. That's the way I, I like to do things. And and that's the way you should do things. Now, uh, just real quick here, Sweet Lynch, that would be the uh, the third one, right? Fourth? Third? Fourth? It's, yeah, it's going to be a third one. It's yeah. going to be a little different. Uh, I, I produce solely the first two. This time around, because of budget restrictions, mm -hmm. I'm basically being hired to be the singer and co-producer and co-writer. Um, and we've got, uh, it, we're going to probably have a different drummer and a different bass player because of budget restraints. And we have a co-producer, Alessandro, who's fantastic at Frontiers. And, you know, the album might take on a little bit of a different vibe, but not necessarily in a bad way. I think it's going to be great. I always said I'd only do another album if I felt that George was going to really get behind it. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm kind of rolling the dice. I mean, I feel like the first two albums... It were just albums that were recorded and thrown out there and then forgotten about after the fact. There was no touring. 
there was there was no effort to try to keep those albums alive and take those albums out to the masses. Unfortunately, I pushed hard for that. I just felt like George had other things going on and it never happened. So I didn't want to do a third album unless that happened. So I'm really hoping that it happens this time around, that we can, you know, we can make sure that it's more than just the release, but we can go and do some shows and play some of these songs live for the fans. Which I think they, they would get a kick of a kick out of. And, and, you know, I, I think as a as a respect to the fans, when you get there, you do all the sweet Lynch stuff and then you do, you know, one or two Striper songs and one or two yeah. whatever, you know, Dawkins songs. And then everybody has a good time and everybody goes home happy. I, you know, that's 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 a good way to do it. Um, let's talk about what you're doing over with Veeps. You have recorded Even the Devil Believes. Uh, entirely live so explain this was it just like you know start the cameras roll and we we run through the entire album is it just selected cuts from the album was it uh was it you know stop and go production where you did one song took a 20 minute break came in talk to me about what you're doing and and how this plays out because you you told me uh, privately that it's it's like 12 or 13 albums explain the sort of this this live concert thing well, I'll tell you, it, the process, uh, there is a little bit more to it than just uh, plug and play and, right. and jam through the songs for an hour. I mean, we all know, even though we don't want to talk about it because it is getting old, you know, we're in a pandemic and COVID, blah, 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 and we're restricted and can't do what we normally do. Um, and I didn't want to do what most other bands are doing, and that's not to, uh, you know, disrespect them. But the live streaming thing, it, it's um, I feel like there's limitations with that. And everyone that I've seen and I've seen maybe 10 or 11 from many bands, there's always been some issue. Whether it was uh, video dropouts uh, because of the stream itself or whether it was audio didn't sound right or the band felt awkward or there was always something that was very strange to me so i didn't want to jump on that bandwagon so what we decided to do because we can't tour is fly the guys out we basically self-quarantined here at my house for two over just over two weeks and followed the guidelines and all that stuff and we rehearsed while we were here then we went into the studio where we record all of our albums it's called spirit house we set up then we started recording. We did about maybe three songs, three to four songs a day because we didn't want to push ourselves. We would start late and end early. And it was more of a party, really. We were eating a lot of food and just hanging out, having a great time. And um, we would go and do three to four songs a day. And, you know, we'd go through each song two or three times and then and then say, OK, and push record and on audio and video. And we would do the song. If we made a big mistake, we'd stop and do it again. Some of the songs we'd play three or four times, maybe five times even on some of the songs until we felt we had a good keeper track. And then that was it. So that's what I mean by live. We didn't go and doctor it all up. And, you know, so it's not comped. I mean, it's not all comped together. It's it's the performance, whether it's the fifth performance or the fourth performance or the third. Right. Exactly. It's not a little bit of one, a little bit of two, a little bit of three and then uh, some post production. It's not that. That's right. Okay. And it's, no, I mean, it's good and bad. So in other words, like my voice. No, honesty is honesty. good. I mean, uh, uh, honesty of a performance is good. Rock and roll was supposed to be warts and stuff. That's that's what makes it rock yeah. and roll. Sanitized rock is not rock and roll. No, totally, totally. And I mean, like my voice wasn't at 100%. It's, it wasn't good. in bad shape, but it, it but, wasn't at 100%. But so, good. You, know, you, you I should be gravelly. I hear that a little bit. And good. that's okay. Yes, it's what it should be. Listen, when I used to go see Aerosmith in 79 or Kiss or whatever in, in 80, there was none of this. We were fixing. Sometimes it was great and sometimes it wasn't, but it was still memorable. So, right. You know. Exactly. Um, exactly. And I tell you what we did. We did two albums. So uh, we spent a total of four days at Spirit House. We recorded four albums. Then it was all put together. And because we did some interview, uh, little excerpt pieces in between, and it was edited together. It's about an hour long. The first one comes out tomorrow. Well, the first one comes out on the 19th. So this interview may not come out by tomorrow, as you said earlier on. <laughs> right. But uh, it's OK. It, it's 
it, See, it's really. It's I won't really even cool, fix man. that. In, I won't fix that in post either. People will know that it was. But uh, yeah, so so it's going to be very cool. <laughs> now, uh, that's even the devil believes that's the world premiere, which is November nineteenth. And of course, by the time you hear this, folks, it'll be available to I guess to rent on demand. Yeah, people. People will be able to rent it and purchase it at veeps.com, and then it will eventually be available uh, as a download, obviously. And then also it'll be a hard copy sold uh, in a Blu-ray format and a CD format, and then eventually it'll be up on YouTube. Now, when you say eventually, let's say I'm listening to this on you know, uh, November 25th, and I go, well, it's going to be on YouTube. I'll just wait. When we talk about wait, we're we're not talking, you know, six days later. It's going to be on YouTube like in a year and a half, kind of thing. Yeah, right? e- exactly. Okay. It's going to be, it's going to be down the road. Obviously, we're going to get through all these stages of, you know, offering it to people as a collectible and right. uh, as a purchase, a purchase item. You know, because that's the way we're going to survive. This is our touring right now. You right. know, and you know what? It, it's probably not a bad thing because. In terms of of monetizing it, uh, you know, when you tour, you can't always necessarily go to Australia or New Zealand or Japan or, you know, sometimes budgets and and time. And so this way it'll be monetizable worldwide. And that's a that's a good thing for the bands. And hopefully uh, out of this pandemic and out of this thing, we will see a new way to keep music alive. And if this is one of them, then, you know, good. I'm I'm all for it. Uh, now you 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 you're going to, and tell me if I if we're, we're re- revealing secrets, but essentially you're going to roll through all of Striper's albums and and do them in this live format, or is, or did I get that wrong? You didn't get it wrong. We're going to roll through not only all the Striper's albums, but all the solo albums as well. And I mean that'll be done. I, we have two entities, two companies: uh, Striper Tours Inc. and Michael Sweet Productions Inc. So Striper Tours Inc. is going to hit all the Striper albums. Michael Sweet Productions is going to hit all the solo albums. And we're going to do two at a time. So the guys will come out here again in you know three months, four months. And we'll rehearse for a couple of weeks, go back to Spirit House or wherever, and do the same thing with two albums. This time around, we did Even the Devil Believes and To Hell with the Devil. Well, that's great. Now... Uh, I'm just going to throw this out there, but it might be a silly question, but are, are you also going to do the covering? Are you going to do a set of all these cover songs? Cause oh kinda... yeah, we'll hit, we'll hit huh. every studio, every studio album we've ever done. So mm. the covering, I consider the covering a studio album. Well, it is. Yeah. Huh. So we'll hit that. We'll hit basically yellow and black attack soldiers under command. Uh, we'll hit, we just hit to hell with the devil. We're going to hit in God we trust, which will really be rare. Uh, we're going to hit against the law. Uh, you know how much I'm going to love that, and then oh, we're going to hit. Yeah, I we're do. Hit all the other albums. And and listen, we have never done an interview where we've not talked about against the law. And I was thinking to myself, <laughs> all right, we're not going to ask about Tom Worman this time. We're just going to move <laughs> on. We're not going to ask about the different color schemes. But okay, you mentioned it, so I'm going to go there. Y- y- I know you don't like the album. I-, I know you think it's it's not what it should be, and it's not it doesn't represent Striper. But okay, you're going to do this. And the fan that is going to watch you do this wants to believe in the material. And so, I mean, if you just sort of, you know, stick your head down, sort of go, ho oh, hum, all right, let me do this. It's going to show. So obviously you're going to have oh, to course. embrace no, it no, somehow. No, no, no. You're going to have to embrace it somehow. So so how oh, do you yeah. do that? Do, do, you, do you listen to the album and say, okay, we're going to tweak this part and tweak that part, maybe rewrite a lyric on this one and make it something new? Or do you just say, okay, fuck it. I have a work ethic and I'm just going to go and do what I got to do. This is my job. And I'll, how are you going to approach it? Yeah, no, no, no. Well, I'll just do what I do. And I've been doing that since 1991. I mean, we play some of those songs live. We play Lady. We play All for One. We play Caught in the Middle on occasion. We play Rock the People on occasion. And I embrace those songs. I always have. I think there's some great songs on that album. All for One is one of my favorite Striper songs of all time. Uh, it, it's just... You know, again, as I've stated many times, the thing the thing that always has left a bitter taste in my mouth was how we changed everything about the band. And if I could go back in time, I would have completely I would rework that. I, I There's no question about it. if I get in a time machine and go back, I say, no, guys, we're not doing this. We're not doing that. And we're not doing this. And we're not doing that. There's no question about yeah. it. But don't you need those moments where you do something out of the box to understand who you are? When you think of the Scorpion doing eye to eye, when you think of Def Leppard doing slang, 
Don't you need that moment where you just go, Ugh, and then when it's done, you go, right, this is what Striper is. Let's get back to that. I mean, isn't it a, a, a moment of epiphany? Yeah, it's a learning experience, and it teaches us, and it helps you to grow and get stronger and all that stuff, for sure. There's no question about it. Absolutely. I just wish that at the time we had realized and, and held on to our integrity a little bit more. Like there was what was wrong with the yellow and black? What I mean, the, the thing is that what's funny about that is we lost the yellow and black. And that's probably the most memorable part of the band. That's probably uh, that's our brand. So we literally it, threw yes. our brand our, we threw our brand out the window. You did. It was like buying a Coke bottle and getting Sprite in it. Exactly. <laughs> so these these are the reasons why I, I kind of cringe when I think, why did we do that? But we did it. You can't cry over spilt milk. No, all and it made you understand that what the brand was. It made you understand who you... So, no, I mean, you know, I see it as a positive. And uh, you have Jeff Scott Soto singing background on that. Does he get an invitation to come and, and, and do it again? Well, I mean, he certainly may get an invitation. I mean, the tricky part is, uh, as much as I love Jeff, and he's amazing, uh, is you're dealing with the COVID thing. You know, when we go and do these things, it's a very limited, it's very weird, because we're, we're in a big room with a select number of people, uh, and we got to kind of, you know, keep the numbers down. Everybody's wearing a mask. The band wears masks and takes them off when we're performing. It's really odd, man. Very odd. I know it's, but uh, if if we get to it when COVID, because remember, there's a Pfizer said ninety five percent vaccine, so who knows? Maybe we can, maybe we can get there. Um, real quick here, uh, you you talked on, on actually, no, you know what? I'm not going to go to that right now. I'm going to go to this, the uh, reborn, uh, which you're going to do again and call it reborn again. Yes, uh, a solo album turned band album because you, you had these great demos and people went, damn. This has got to be Striper. This is really good. Uh, you want to get those original versions out because the guys that played on it, they, they deserve that respect of, hey, you know what? Our, my band loved these so much because of your performances. Uh, so talk to me about doing that. Do you re-record the whole thing? Is it just the old demos that are that are polished up and made to sound big and big and beautiful? What, what are fans getting with Reborn Again? Well, first of all, it, 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 it's really amazing. I, most of the response has been so positive and so great and overwhelming. And, and it just, I love it. Incredible. But there's those people that always come out of the woodwork that you know, kind of beat you up a little bit. And you know, I've heard comments like, you know, how can you do this? And uh, another guy said, you know, have you talked to the guys about this? It's very disrespectful to the guys. And I, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute here. It was a solo album originally, and it became a striper album. And what's funny is when you hear the original solo album, there's no difference. It's it's the identical arrangements. It it you'd swear it's the same record until you hear the depth of it. I mean, the thing about the old original drum tracks and bass tracks and whatnot. Uh, is there's just a little bit more depth to it because we did it in a different studio. And then what I did is I went and added some more guitars and some guitar solos and, and kind of gave it more energy. And now it's really, in my opinion, I hope when you hear it, you'll agree. I think it's really stepped up a lot. And, but, you know, how can I be disrespecting the guys when originally it was a solo album? I just don't understand comments like that. Something I've always wanted to do was release it in its original form. And I have the opportunity to do it now. So I, I took advantage of that. And it's going to be coming out as a limited edition sometime in March, probably. And then it'll be available for download and all that good stuff as well. Yeah. And, and folks just have to wait for uh, 2022 when you release Re-Reborn again with Striper upping the game. <laughs> Once again, they'll be like, hey, now we're going to record it with Perry Richardson. Just wait till you see this now, you know. <laughs> no, it'll be, we'll call it Reborn once again. How's that? <laughs> oh, yeah, Re-Reborn. Oh, Reborn once again. No, but uh, I, I, by the way, the, the, were fans complaining? About, like, that's a really st well, stupid complaint. And no, look, I mean, I don't want to disrespect a fan, but, you know. Please. I'm a tough I'm a tough guy. I've got thick skin. I, and some people might laugh at that, but trust me, I do. And uh but man, you wouldn't believe 
some of the things that we have to read and hear. Oh, it, I, get, I get it too it, on on my stuff. It it drives yeah, me crazy. I mean, I could post a, I could post a picture of me eating a hamburger, and I'll get grief for it. Yes. Yeah. It, it's just so stupid. It's unbelievable. But the good thing is that we always have to remind ourselves is it's few and far between. It's I mean the the positive folks far outweigh the negative folks. Yeah, I'd like to think unless you talk about like Guns and Roses, they they have a, a very uh, interesting set of fans who are always out to send something anyway. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's not uh, let's not d- denigrate anybody. All right, so uh, let me get over here and and we'll we'll start wrapping up in a second. But you talked about the uh, greatest guitar vocalist on on your Facebook, and you put Chuck uh, Chuck Berry, Mark Farner, by the way, which is offered as an interview to me. So good. Uh, yeah, I love you, I love Mark. Yeah, Mark's Mark's great, but you also list Canadian Rick Emmett, and you list a personal friend Joe Bonamassa. But what I find interesting in your list is that you don't keep it to one genre. I mean, to to say that Joe Bonamassa and Chuck Berry do the same thing, you know, maybe in a, in a in a in a kind of sphere, but you know, it's different. Manichetti from, of course, Y and T and Prince, very different. Stevie Ray Vaughan from, you know, John Sykes. How did you come to that, and and how do you, how do you sort of see your, your music knowledge? Do do you limit yourself just to sort of hard rock and metal, or do you, when you're not doing Striper, you sit at home and just listen to Beatle records all day? What 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 does what does Michael like musically? Well, first of all, I don't even listen to music. Really? No, no. When I do. It, it, I mean, it's rare when I do, but when I do, like if when my wife and I are having a nice dinner here, I cook for her, she cooked for me or whatever, and we got the candle lights going, you know, we'll put on jazz, you know, we'll put on something, something like that. Uh, I'm not, it's not like you have metal blasting in the sweet household all the time at all or in the car. Uh, I, I rarely have any music on in the car at all. It's just silence. You can hear the sound of the AC or the heater blowing. That's about it. Um, I, I just now growing up from the time I became interested in guitar when I was five to now, I'm 57 years old. Uh, I listed those players as guys uh, that basically have made me smile the most. Those are the guys that when I hear them, my ears perk up. When I see them, I smile. And I want to hear and see them more than others. And, right. and it's as simple as that. Man, well, it's a, it's, it's a great list. And here, I'll just quickly go over to the uh, the best vocalist list here. And and this one, I, I'm going to have to say, I, I agree. Rob Halford, Bruce Dickinson, Ronnie James Dio, Klaus Mein, Ian Gillen, Bon Scott, Glenn Hughes. Merci, bonsoir. Let's go home. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, how, how do you say no to any of them? I mean, you you could maybe say I'll add this guy or I'll add that guy, but there's not one on here where you go, yeah, no, no, yeah, that like yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was that was more on the metal side list. I mean, people started throwing out a bunch of other names, Freddie Mercury, and who I love, and uh, the, you know, they were throwing out. Uh, just a number of other singers. And I kept reminding them, this is a little bit more on the metal side of vocalist for me. You mean I they mean, can't read where you wrote, it's the most hard rock metal vocalist ever to exist, in my opinion? Boy, that's... No. Boy, no, read, reading people, is difficult, huh? People <laughs> fail to read the headline sometimes, sadly. <laughs> but, you know, it's, if I had to pick, like, if you said, who's your favorite singer of all time? I'd instantly say Steve Perry. Of course. That's it. He's my favorite. And always will be, because I think emotion and and technical ability, and he had it all. He had such a gift, unlike any other voice, male voice, in my opinion. So Steve wasn't on that list because well, he's not hard rock metal. metal. (laughs) Exactly. Now, what about Paul Stanley? Because if you say metal, I would maybe say Kiss is more hard rock, but then your list does say hard rock, and you have covered, of course, shout it out loud, and you've done other Kiss stuff. No, no Kiss. I, well, I got to say, here's the thing about Kiss. I, I really respect Kiss, and I love Kiss, and I enjoy Kiss. And when I saw them when I was young, I went with my brother to see them at the Forum, 
and I was all of but maybe you know 12 years old, 13 years old at the time. I remember being in awe like everybody else in the arena and blown away. And I think Paul is so gifted in terms of being a front man slash singer slash guitar player, which is what I am. I'm a singer, guitar player, front man, same kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I just for whatever reason, I was always drawn a little bit more to the guys and this isn't to take anything away from Paul, but to the guys that did a little bit more on the guitar and the guys that did a little bit more vocally, you know, um, and that's just that's just me. It doesn't mean that Paul wouldn't be on my list if it was uh, top 25 or top, you know, 35 or what have you. But that was just the list of what, eight or nine, nine guys, you know. So my top 10, Paul, I probably wouldn't put Paul in my top 10, but. He's no doubt, uh, you know, an amazing talent and a legend. Yeah. yeah and you know what? I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of lists because people, you know, I, I like the guys. I like Danny Bowes of Thunder. I like Steve Lee of Goth. I like these guys. A lot, a lot of people don't know about him. People go, oh, how, how dare you call him great vocalism? I go, my ears like him. That's my exactly. judge. Exactly. <laughs> don't exactly. tell me. Don't tell me what my ears need to like. My ears likes these guys. Anyway. I know. I know. I had a guy come on on Facebook and say, this list is wrong, man. You need to add this, this and that. And I said, no, I will not add to this so and so to my list on my page. <laughs> Just like, oh, exactly. my gosh. Yeah, it's I mean, crazy. I often talk about Duran Duran on my page and people will go, you're a metal guy. You can't like Duran Duran. It's like, but why? <laughs> They're the perfect pop. They did. They did pop more perfectly than any other band from like 82 to 88. I mean, yeah. they, the, the songs were four minutes, sugary, sweet treats, and everyone was a hit. Like, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Yeah. I love Duran Duran. Well, how can you not tell? And I think, I think they're one of the few bands that have made comebacks with their strongest songs. Like ordinary world is one of, one of their best songs ever. And I think they're an amazing band. And I also love, and I'm, I'm proud to say it, I love Bread. And people are like, what? And I love Al Green. People are like, what? And I love ABBA. Well, everybody loves ABBA. Well, not you everybody. Know. I used to, I used to like Well, the wrong my, people my, don't like him, but. I used to stuff my CDs in envelopes, you know, for weeks when I was selling my Truth album on my own in my basement. Uh -huh. And I'd put Dancing Queen on rotation. I'd hear that <laughs> 200 times a day. Oh, that's fantastic. But all right, let me ask you this just real quick, because uh, now I'm curious. But uh, in terms of Simon Le Bon, how do you see him as a vocalist? Because, I mean, he's not an opera singer. He's not, you know, but he's got that distinctive voice. And and I like distinctive voices. You know, we, we can talk all, you know, uh, all, all the metrics on Stephen Piercy or Stephen Tyler, but it's that it's that 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 fingerprint of a voice that I love. Right. You know what right. I mean? I um, agree. And, yeah. and so how do you how do you look at a Simon Lebon in terms of a vocal style? <laughs> you know what I liked about Simon, and I like about Simon is the minute you hear him open his mouth and sing, you know it's Simon. Yes, and that's what it's makes a good instantaneous. vocalist. Instantaneous. The first note, yes. that's Simon LeBon. And yes. he's got a very signature sound and tone and style. Yes. And, you know, technically, is he the best singer? No. no. But, you know, neither neither is David Lee Roth. And I love David Lee Roth. So. Yeah. And, and, and I will say the same thing. Like, uh, maybe not that they're great singers, but, I mean, they are great singers. But when you hear Jack Russell sing, you go, bang, that's Jack. Yep. You hear Stephen Pierce, yep. you go, bang, that's Rat. And yep. you, you can't replace those kind of guys. Those guys yeah. are the sound. And you, you, you can't. can't. And I mean, we all know, it, it, as another example, Quiet Riot, <laughs> Kevin Dubrow. You know, I was never a huge Kevin Dubrow fan in terms of his voice. I just, it, it, it never clicked in my mind. And it made me go, wow, for whatever reason. And, uh, but what a, you know, definable, such a unique voice. And, and we've all seen recently in recent times that he's, he's irreplaceable. You can't, you can't replace them. I mean, all these other guys have come and gone through Quiet Riot and they, they're great singers, you know, uh, no question about it at all. But they, they just, I don't know what it is, man. He just had such a unique thing, love it or hate it. 
And by the way, that's that's where Van Halen did it right. When they came in with Sammy, they didn't have Sammy sing a 20-song David Lee Roth set because everybody would have said, wow, he doesn't sound like Dave, and they would have bailed. They came in and they did Sammy stuff. And that, I think that was the smart move. And, and sometimes you just got to do that. You just got to create new music and say, all right, well, that's the old guy, and here's the new guy. Like they did with you know, Bad Company and Brian Howe. Absolutely. They totally. You, you have to some, sometimes reinvent the wheel, yep. you know, and I think even Journey did that to a degree. You know, they had Greg Raleigh on keys and, and a little different sound. And then Steve Perry came in and, and once he started taking on all the lead vocals, they, they developed a much uh, a much different sound. Still Journey, undeniably, but very different. Yeah. And on that, we we're at 40 minutes, so we will. uh we will reel this one in, and uh, we will state again, and let me get the name here again. Uh, as Wayne Perry said, even the devil believes is heavenly good. And so if you haven't checked out the album, use that review as your guiding light, because that pretty much says it all, right? Well, man, we're, we're really, and I say this humbly, and even if I say we're proud of something, I get flack for that, too. People say, oh, man, you're not supposed to be proud. You're, you're a Christian. But I'm very proud of how this album turned out i really am and um you know i'm i think everybody delivered everyone did an outstanding job oz rob perry and you know it all shows there's an energy on this album that is uh stepped up a level or two and every song as they say there's a, you know it's all killer no filler there's there's no filler on this album really i don't really skip over any songs there's a few songs i don't like as much as as the others but i don't skip songs so that's always a good sign too that's a that's a great sign and and i'll finish again with wayne's words he says uh, this i pray is striper's own blaze of glory and the divider is the best song a judas priest never wrote there you go <laughs> There you go. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you on that because I'm a huge priest fan, and that definitely has a little bit of a priest vibe to it for sure. Yeah. Now, now those were Wayne's. Uh, what's his name? Wayne Perry's word from uh, Associated Press, and that's they high praise and the best song Priest never wrote. Come on, that's that's amazing. And, and Wayne's given us really uh, exceptional reviews over the years. He's reviewed a number of our albums uh, with the Associated Press, and. He's always uh, very kind. So it, he, he likes what we're doing, which is really cool. And you know what? I think the rest of the rock world does, too, because you, you don't have a 40-year music career because the, the fans think you're chumps. So keep, keep doing what you're doing. We love it. We're going to keep trying, man. And, and, you know, one of these days I, we're going to come out with something that's going to make heads spin and, and, you know, do something really unique and different, but still Striper, 100%, and we'll see what happens. But there's a lot more to come, for yeah. sure. Well, listen, the, the the video stuff that you're doing and going to release, as you stated, that is unique and different. And I, and, and, and I appreciate that, and I, I hope it does gangbusters for you, because as we know in this business, if somebody has success, everybody copies it, and I would have no objection to the bands I love following that game plan and putting out this kind of stuff, you know, re-recorded live. So let's hope you sell a million of each. Well, buddy, I appreciate it, man. And the, the hard part with doing that is the finances, the, uh, the investment, because it wasn't cheap. You know, it costs money up front to do something like that. And I think that's the, the tough part for most bands is they don't have the money. The reason why Striper had the money is because we have a very smart management team. And we put money away for a rainy day and we're able to get things done like that during down times, you know. So we're very blessed that way. There you go. And uh, on that, uh, as we say in Montreal, merci beaucoup. Always, always a pleasure, Mr. Sweet. Hey, brother. Likewise, man. Sorry it took us so long to talk. And thanks for always giving me the time of day, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Anytime. And uh, when the other stuff comes out, let's do another one. Always, always a pleasure to plug this. Stuff. I love it, man. I look forward to it, buddy. And please stay healthy and safe and be careful out there, okay? Absolutely. You too. Cheers. Okay, ma'am.